Hello, my name is David Hopewell. I work for Gwyneth Archaeological Trust. Um, this is the first of a short series of informal lectures about recent work by the Trust. Um, our first few are going to be about uh, the work we've done to do with Roman uh, Gwyneth. Uh, first one will be an introduction, just to give us a timeline and get an idea of what, we, uh, what we're talking about. Um, if you want to find out more about Gwyneth Archaeological Trust, uh, you can look at, up our website, which is www.heneb.co.uk. Right, so the Romans, the Romans in Wales, the Romans in uh, Gwynedd. Before the Romans got here, the inhabitants were living in roundhouse settlements. They, we had uh, hill forts. And a kind uh, there's a, there was a tribal groupings. We don't really know where the boundaries of the tribes were. Uh, we we know the names of some of them. So we had the Order Vices, which tended to be in the south southern part, probably, and certainly in the west. Uh, the Decangli, who were in the north east of Wales, and the Gangani, who we don't know much about, but uh, possibly have links to Ireland, uh, which were on the Llyn Peninsula. Uh, the, these uh, tribal names are mentioned by the Romans quite often, so it's important to remember them. Uh, but uh, we don't really know where the boundaries of these tribes' uh, territories were. Uh, prior to the Roman conquests, um, the Romans would, were definitely not unheard of. There was a lead anchor stock found in the sea near Abadaron, which uh, on the, at the end of the Flint Peninsula, it was could be from anywhere from the second century BC to the early part of the first century AD. Uh, this was uh, pre-conquest, so it shows that there was exploration and trade uh, uh, re reaching even the remote parts of, uh, of North Wales. Right, the conquests themselves. I'm not. I could spend a lot, a lot of time talking about this. This is just going to be a quick run through. Um, the first conquest in to Britain were by Julius Caesar in fifty five and fifty four BC. Uh, this wasn't something that really lasted. Uh, and, and Tacitus, a Roman writer, wrote that it must be said that that Caesar revealed rather than bequeathed Britain to Rome. So before um, Caesar had visited, Britain was a, a, a kind of mysterious place. People didn't really know much about it. Uh, it was perhaps seen as magical. It was or you know, an El Dorado or something. Uh, Caesar actually got to see the place. Uh, some things he said were the, the number of the people is countless and their buildings are exceedingly numerous and for in the most part they're like the Gauls which is sensible them just being across the channel he said all the Britons dye themselves with woad which, occasion, which occasions a bluish colour and therefore they are more terrible in battle they wear their hair long and have every part of their body shaved apart from their head and their upper lip Ten and even twelve have wives common to them. He was also very impressed with the chariots and uh, in, of, of the British armies. He noted that the institution of Druidism is thought to have originated in Britain and to have been thenceforth introduced into Gaul. And even now those who wish to become more accurately acquainted with it generally go to Britain for the sake of learning it. The real invasion uh, was uh, quite a gradual process, but beginning in AD 43 under the Emperor Claudius uh, and was sort of largely completed by the end of the uh, AD 80s. Um, Wales was actually affected quite early on. Uh, AD 47 to 48 were the first moves against the Decangli in the north uh, East Wales, they didn't actually go all that well. There was quite a lot going on, quite a lot of moves against different tribes. Uh, it wasn't really until AD 60 and 61 and the, the, under the new governor Suetonius Paulinus 
that we uh, actually started seeing uh, things happening in North Wales. He made his way through Wales, uh, culminating on the famous attack on Anglesey that is written about by Tacitus. I will read it out to you because it's quite it's quite instructive. Uh, Suetonius Paulinus prepared to attack the island of Mona, which had a considerable, considerable population of its own, while serving as a haven for refugees. In view of the shallow and variable channel, the Menai Strait, uh, he constructed a flotilla of boats with flat bottoms. By this math method, the infantry crossed. The cavalry who followed did so by fording, or in deeper water, by swimming at the side of their horses. On the beach stood the adversary, a serried mass of arms and men, with women flitting between the ranks, in the style of the Furies, in robes of deathly black, and with dishevelled hair they brandished their torches, while a circle of druids, lifting their hands to heaven and showering curses, struck the troops with such an awe at the extraordinary spectacle that, as though their limbs were paralysed, they exposed their bodies to wounds without an attempt at movement. Then, reassured by their general and inciting each other never to flinch between, before a band of females and fanatics, they charged behind the standards, cut down all who met them and enveloped the enemy in his own flames. The next step was to install a garrison amongst the con conquered population and to demolish the groves consecrated, consecrated to their savage cults for they considered it a pious duty to slake the altars with captive blood and to consult their deities by means of human entrails. While he was thus occupied, the sudden revolt of the province, this is Boudica and the Iceni, was announced to Suetonius, and he left. You can see here a map of the uh, known archaeology from that uh, campaign. Absolutely nothing. All we know is from Tacitus's writings. If it wasn't for Tacitus, we wouldn't have known about this invasion. We wouldn't be seeing uh, Anglesey as being the centre of Druidism. He's got a lot to answer for. It's uh, it, it's it's interesting that we that 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 is pretty much the only information we have about that, and we're very much going by what he says, and how reliable is is his narration? We don't really know. Um, it sounds like it is based in uh, in uh, fact, but some of the things about the druids and the furies and all that kind of stuff might just be propaganda. Uh, well, things moved on. Uh, after that, uh, the Romans didn't come back for quite some time. Under the Flavian emperors, uh, moves began into Wales again, uh, and most notably under Agricola from 77 to 78. He put down a serious rebellion of the Ordovices and almost wiped out the fighting force of the tribe, so it's said. And then he decided to take on the island of Mona again. Um, he had no fleet, uh, but decided to go with a rather sudden attack and he had um, some auxiliaries who, who could swim across the Menai Straits with their arms and horses and as Tacitus says he delivered so unexpected an attack that the astonished enemy who were looking for a fleet, a naval armament and an assault by the sea thought to such assailants nothing could be formidable or invincible and so peace having been sued for and the island given up, Agricola became great and famous. Now it should be noted that Tacitus maybe wasn't the most uh, unbiased uh, narrator. He was married to Agricola's daughter. So uh, interesting. It might he might you might not see him as being the most unbiased narrator, but there we go. So we're moving in to the occupation. Uh, and the uh, uh, proper. Now I think that probably the first um, thing to be built in Gwynedd was the was a major fort at Llanvor. Now this was a fort um, built out of wood, a large a large fort meant to uh, 
house a lot of men and with the stores compound and it looks like this was probably the base which from which the the Romans moved into the rest of uh, northwest Wales. As you can see from the slide the uh, uh, fort was absolutely crammed full of men uh, and this was probably one of the first things that was built as part of this invasion within the, within northwest Wales. Um, there probably were things like uh, marching camps so these are, were sort of temporary installations that, uh, that were built um, and there would also have been these in the previous uh, in the previous invasion under sort of Suetonius Paulinus. I just don't think we found them yet. So this was the beginning of the uh, beginning of the invasion, and and this, it was soon superseded by this, as you can see on the slide, this uh, network of forts and roads uh, that were built in uh, uh, the late seventies A.D. Um, they cover most of uh, most of Gwynedd and indeed most of Wales. Uh, I think there are probably still quite a few gaps. Uh, we, there is, doesn't seem to be anything much on uh, on the much uh, conquered island of Anglesey. So I think we're actually missing a fort on there. And there are a few other rather suspicious gaps. Uh, so I don't think we've necessarily got to the end of this uh, of this uh, particular uh, set of fortifications. Uh, the slide here gets, shows you a fairly typical example of the forts that they were building. These are called auxiliary forts, much smaller than the Tlanvor, uh, holding a, a smaller, a smaller a garrison. Uh, we'll talk about these in a, a, a later lecture. This is the one at Canovium in the uh, Conway Valley. A, a smaller fort than the than Tlanvor, and also you can see that it has a what's called a vicus, a civilian settlement uh, to the north of it. We'll be looking at these in a bit more detail in a later lecture. But this is the kind of thing that would have been appearing in the landscape at this time. So this was the start of the Roman occupation pro proper. Uh, we might be looking in Wales of maybe 10% of the population were, were Roman occupiers at some point, some points at the, uh, the beginning of this uh, of this process. It was a militarised zone, there's no doubt about it to start off with that it was a militarised zone. The Romans were here to stay, well not to stay, they were here for th about 300 years and you, to put that in perspective that's about if you look at thinking of that in the, the equivalent of British history that's as if they for, from the perspective of now that would have been they would have had arrived in 1703 uh, when Queen Anne was on the throne but things changed so we started off with a militarized zone if we look at the look at the the map of Roman uh, military Gwynedd in AD 130 to 150 this is not all that long after the uh, invasion we notice that most of the forts are, are no longer occupied so something's changed uh, and we're looking at something that is, doesn't appear to be quite the same sort of militarised landscape. This situation carried on for a further 230 years. This is a long time. This is something that people tend to forget about. Everybody gets very wrapped up in the idea of the Druids and the and fighting on Anglesey. But for 230 years, the equivalent of since the reign of George III, we were looking at something that doesn't appear to be quite such a militarised zone. Indeed, from 150 onwards, the only fort that was really being occupied was Sigontium. The rest of it, the Romans had gone, they had other priorities. So something else was going on in this, in the, in this period. Um, I think the thing to look at next is one of our recent discoveries, which is a settlement at uh, Tychochion on, the other, on Anglesey, the other side of the Menau Strait from Sigontium. This was a trading settlement. This is what was going on at this point. The Romans were still in charge, but they were not fighting. We were not suffering. It doesn't appear there were there was uh, any fighting going on. It appears that the uh, what what was important was trade and probably getting taxes. Um, Tychochium was a very rich settlement. We we'll, again we'll be looking at this one in a later later lecture. It was rich, undefended, and was obviously principally for trade with Anglesey. So this was what was important at this time. 
Here are a couple of uh, slides of Tychokion. This is one of the, uh, the the map of the site from uh, taken from the Geophysical Survey. We've got a Roman road with about 20 odd houses uh, alongside it. These houses, very notably, are not roundhouse round houses that you would normally expect in North Wales. These are big rectangular houses in the style of Roman Roman. It's not quite a villa, but it's a, it, I think it's what would be called the corridor house. So, to a small extent, people were taking up Roman uh, customs and they were certainly trading with the Romans. This was an important part of their of life. But the Roman soldiers were not uh, all over the landscape like they were in the militarised phase at the beginning. Uh, so, this, as we said, this carried on for quite a long time and towards the end of the uh, Roman uh, occupation of, of Gwynedd, uh, things changed a little. Um, we note that on this, this slide here that you can see uh, there's a new addition at Caergubbi. This is at Hollyhead. So this is a small naval base. Uh, there are a couple of, um, you can just about see them on the map, there are a couple of uh, uh, watchtowers looking down on over the over the naval base. Things were becoming a bit dicey at this point in the Roman uh, Roman occupation. We're looking around AD 360s through to the beginning of 370s. Um, there's raiding coming in from Ireland and all kinds of um, instability over the across the empire. Um, one fort came back into use to some extent at Canovium in the Conway Valley, but the main constant was again Sigontium. So once we get to the end of the 4th century, the Romans left. I'm not sure they left altogether, but they moved away and we were left with this map, which shows uh, what we're looking at now really, they left us a bunch of ruins for us archaeologists to study. Well, obviously that wasn't their idea, but uh, that's what happened. So, um, what we're going to do from this point onwards, I think we're going to have a go at doing a, a series of short lectures looking at different aspects of the work that we've looked at. Uh, the work that we've done looking at these, uh, at these uh, uh, monuments. So perhaps four more short lectures. The first one was the first project that we did, which was a Roman fort environs project. We were looking at forts in the wider landscape using geophysical survey and excavation. And we we're finding settlements, uh, official inns, bathhouses, all kinds of things. Uh, very exciting project, really moved uh, our knowledge of Roman, uh, Roman Wales forward. Uh, one particular site that came up in this was at Llanvor, so perhaps I'll do that one as a separate short lecture. I've already mentioned that one. We then moved on to Roman roads. Uh, we had lots of records of Roman roads in our historical environment record. Some of them were very good pieces of research, other things were not so good. So trying to sort out the difference between old roads that have been called Roman roads and actual Roman military roads. So that was a, a quite a long standing and useful project. And finally, I think we'll perhaps have a look at the excavations at Tai Kokion. This was a the Roman civilian settlement that I mentioned earlier. It was a very unexpected discovery and is a very is a very important site. So I think perhaps we'll have a look at that next. So uh, that's the end of this uh, lecture. Um, hopefully see you for another one soon.